Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering tocolytics, and these are medications that suppress uterine activity. If you haven't done so already, guys, please don't forget, like this video, subscribe to my channel, press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Um, historically, I've always released a new video only on Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where I would go over questions, teach you how to answer these questions. But I started providing lessons during the week, and I do them randomly whenever I have a good 45 minutes to an hour. So press that red notification button. So as soon as a new video is released, you'll be notified. Don't forget, guys, I have audio lessons available for you on my website. If you're really struggling with um, certain type of content and you really need that grade to pass, check out my audio lessons, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And don't forget, I have videos every single day that I do on my social media platform, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. So guys, let's get started. Suppression of uterine activity. Look at this. Tocolytics, don't mind my makeup's all over this book. Tocolytics are medications given to arrest labor. Look at what I circled, guys. After, after uterine contraction and cervical change has occurred. What does this tell us? This tells us that we're not going to give tocolytics to a patient if there hasn't been any um, uh, change in their cervical dilation or effacement. Okay? No medications that have been approved for tocolytics by the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration are currently available in the United States. Does that mean that here in the U.S. we don't give tocolytics? Of course not. Yes, we do. But here's what happens. Because there are no drugs in the U.S. that have been approved for that purpose, we use other drugs, you know, like drugs for hypertension and other drugs that have the same effect as tocolytics, we use them as off-label. That word off-label, guys, that means when you use a drug, but not for its intended purpose, okay? So let's keep going. It says, however, it's still used as a tocolytic in other countries. Even though tocolytics are not approved here in the US, they are approved in other countries. Drugs marketed for other purposes, such as treatment for asthma or hypertension or anti-inflammatory or analgesic agents are used on an off-label basis. So these are the type of drugs that um, have the effect of tocolytics that we use as off-label. You guys need to know that. Why? We want to suppress preterm labor. But look at this. No tocolytic has been shown to reduce the rate of preterm labor. So if tocolytics don't reduce the rate of preterm labor, why would we give this to mom? Let me tell you why. We want to delay. We want to delay that preterm labor in order to give her time to get to a higher acuity hospital. So it's not like we're giving her the tocolytics because we just don't want her to give birth. No, we're just trying to give ourselves enough time to get her higher acuity care, okay? Um, no tocolytic has been shown to reduce the rate of preterm birth. Rather, the rationale for giving these medications is to delay birth long enough to allow time for maternal transport to a level three or level four neonate care center and for, look at this guys, corticosteroids to reach maximum benefit to reduce the neonatal mor morbidity and mortality. When you see that word morbidity, um, that means illness and mortality, that means death. Why would we give them corticosteroids for their lungs so that they can actually survive outside of the womb? Okay, let's keep going. Important contraindications exist to the use of all tocolytics. So there are certain contraindications, there are certain situations that we are not going to give a tocolytic to our patient. Maternal and fetal um, contraindications to tocolytic therapy are listed in box 17.4. And then box 17.5 describes the nursing care for women receiving tocolytics. So let's take a look. Let's go to box 17.4 first. Contraindications to tocolytic therapy. I actually covered this on my last video, but I'll go over this again. When would we not give tocolytics to the mom? If she has preeclampsia or gestational hypertension with what type of features? Severe features, which means she's symptomatic, right? Hemorrhage, if the lady's bleeding to death. Significant cardiac disease. What about um, the fetus? 
gestational age of 37 weeks or more. Why? Because by 37 weeks, we expect that that fetus will have enough surfactant that they can survive outside the womb. Fetal demise. If that fetus is dead inside of the womb, we're going to try to get that fetus out. We don't want mom to get an infection. We don't want her to become septic. Lethal fetal anomaly, chorioamnionitis, that's the infection of um, the, the sac, and, or actually that's infection of the fluid that's in the sac, I should say, or evidence of acute or chronic fetal compromise. So all of these are contraindications where we would not give tocolytics. And remember, tocolytics delay mom's giving birth because what does it do? It suppresses the contraction of the uterus. All right, moving on. First drug we're going to talk about. Oh, look, box 17.5. What's on there? Nursing care? No, we'll talk about nursing care in a minute. Let's go over drugs. So um, first drug we're going to cover, guys, is magnesium sulfate. Let me make this bigger for you. Magnesium sulfate is the most commonly used tocolytic agent because maternal, fetal, and neonatal adverse reactions are less severe and less frequent than with beta adrenergic agonists. So when it comes to um, uh, giving a patient a medication for the action of tocolytics, usually you're going to see magnesium sulfate given. Now, let me make this clear, guys. I talked about this in my first video. I'm gonna say this again, because this is a test question. You have to understand this. Magnesium sulfate relaxes. It depresses, right? It suppresses that uterine activity. So because it relaxes things, it also relaxes those vessels, right? So it decreases blood pressure. Yes, that's a side effect of this medication, but it's not an indication. We are not going to give a patient magnesium sulfate because they have hypertension. There are so many better drugs on the market for hypertension that has less adverse effects. So that's a great thing. It brings down the blood pressure, but it's not going to be an indication. You have to understand that. We're giving this magnesium sulfate for what? To suppress the uterine activity. Don't say I didn't warn you. Let's keep going. Although magnesium sulfate is still frequently used, its effectiveness as a tocolytic is not supported by literature. Remember, there are no tocolytics that are approved here in the US. We are using them all as what? Off label. Let's move to terbutaline. Terbutaline, the most commonly administered beta adrenergic agonist. Remember, this has more adverse effects than magnesium sulfate does. The most um, commonly administered beta adrenergic agonist used for tocolytics, look what it does. Again, relaxes. It relaxes uterine smooth muscle by stimulating beta receptors in the uterine smooth muscle. Terbutaline is often given subcutaneously to facilitate maternal transfer to a tertiary or, let me try to pronounce this word, quaternary center or to initiate tocolytic therapy while another agent with slower onset of action is administered at the same time. Couple important things for you guys to grasp here when it comes to terbutaline. Number one, you have to know that it's a beta adrenergic agonist. Number two, you have to know the action. How does it work? Right here, it relaxes the smooth muscle. And by therefore relaxing that uterine smooth, uh, uh, uterine smooth muscle activity. Okay, that's the second thing. Three, we give it sub-Q. Where's the sub-Q? I know I just saw it right here. Those are the three most important things that you need to get out of this. You have to know that. Terbutaline has the potential to cause serious maternal <gasps> cardiac problems and death. Well, you know, that's interesting because didn't we see up here that one of the contraindications was if mom has had significant cardiac disease. So it makes sense that we're gonna stay away from giving mom a tocolytic if she has significant cardiac disease. It makes sense, right? Okay. Nephetapine. 
This is a calcium channel blocker. This is a tocolytic agent that again, suppresses contractions. Look at how this one works. Look at this method of action. It works by preventing calcium from entering the smooth muscle cells, thereby reducing the uterine contractions. Remember, hypocalcemia causes what? Nerve, muscle irritability, right? Hyper does the opposite, okay? Let's take a look at this table, tocolytic, Tocolytic therapy for preterm labor. <laughs> right here, I wrote make drug cards. I tell my students that is the best way. When it comes, you know, when it comes to nursing guys, there's really not much memorization. Most of it you have to understand. Most of it is critical thinking. But when it comes to pharmacology, baby, you got to know those drugs. You have to know those drugs. And these are one of them. I suggest you guys make drug cards. Okay. So magnesium sulfate. Look at the action. CNS depressant, it slows things down. It relaxes the smooth muscle, including the uterus. What does it do to the mom? She can have hot flashes, burning at the IV insertion site, hypocalcemia. Some reactions may subside when do loading dose is completed. These are um, adverse effects that we can see um, in the mom, but look at the intolerable. That means absolutely, if we see this, we are going to call the doctor right away. Respiratory rate fewer than 12 breaths per minute. Pulmonary edema, is there ever supposed to be fluid in the lungs? Absolutely not. Absent tendon, uh, deep tendon reflexes. Remember, it slows everything down. It relaxes things, right? But we don't want to relax those reflexes to the point that they're absent chest pain, severe hypotension, because remember, um, one of the side effects of this medication is bringing down that blood pressure. Safety is an issue. We don't want to bring it down too much that we cause them to have hypotension. Altered level of consciousness, extreme weakness, um, serum magnesium level of 10 MEQs or greater. We don't want to give them, excuse me, we don't want to give them mag toxicity. What can we see in the fetus? Although uh, uncommon, we may see decreased breathing movement, decreased fetal heart variability, and non-reactive NST, non-stress test. So what are you going to do for that patient that is on mag sulfate? Look at this. The drug's given almost always IV, but can be given IM. You're going to be checking your um, magnesium levels. Monitor the serum magnesium levels with higher doses. The therapeutic range, you have to know that therapeutic range will be tested on it. And it's four to 7.5. Discontinue the infusion and notify if intolerable adverse effects occur. So if you see anything on this list, any of these, the first thing you're going to do is stop the infusion. Whenever something's wrong with your patient, the first thing you want to do is stop what's killing them, right? So the first thing you're going to do is stop the infusion, then you notify the physician or healthcare provider. Ensure calcium gluconate or calcium chlorides available. Why? Because if that patient goes into mag toxicity, we want to reverse it. So you want to make sure that these are available for emergency administration to reverse the magnesium sulfate toxicity. Do not give to women with myasthenia gravis. And I know I talked about this already in the first video, but I promise you guys are going to get a good amount of questions on these. That's why I'm going over it again. Beta-adrenergic blockers. Terbutaline. Relaxes the smooth muscle. Maternal adverse effect. We can see tachycardia, increased heart rate, chest pain, palpitation, arrhythmias. That's why we got to be careful, right? Especially anyone who has heart disease. Isn't that a contraindication? Absolutely. Nervousness, dizziness, hypokalemia. Having too much or too little potassium can kill you. Potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of that patient can have dysrhythmia. So we have to be very careful, okay? It causes hypokalemia, hyperglycemia. So we better be looking at that patient's blood glucose. Hypotension, again, safety. So we're going to be taking vitals. We're going to be keeping an eye on that blood pressure. Look at these intolerable conditions. Anything on this list, 
you're going to withhold that medication. You're going to stop that medication. You're going to stop that IV and call the doctor right away. Tachycardia greater than 130 beats per minute. Normal heart rate is supposed to be 60 to 100. More than 130, you're going to stop and call the doctor. Blood pressure less than 90 over 60. Your range is supposed to be 90 over 60 to 140 over 90. Less than 90 over 60, stop the infusion, call the doctor. Chest pain, cardiac arrhythmias, MI, myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema. Nursing interventions for um, when giving that medication terbutaline. It should not be used in women with known or suspected heart disease. And you see why, look at that chest pain, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, hypotension. So we're not gonna give a woman with heart disease, um, pre-gestational or gestational diabetes. Why? We just saw here that it can cause hyperglycemia. So if the patient already has gestational diabetes, do you think that's a good idea to give this to them that would make their blood sugar go even higher? No. Hyperthyroidism. Well, we saw that this medication can cause tachycardia. It can increase your heart rate. Let's think about the action of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland makes you go, 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 go. Speeds up blood pressure, speeds up heart rate. Everything's going, going, going. So a patient with hyperthyroidism, where their heart rate's already going to be high, you think this would be a good medication to give them terbutaline? No. It makes sense, guys. This is how you're supposed to use your critical thinking. When you're reading the book and you're studying, don't just try to memorize. Say to yourself, okay, why, why is this happening? Because when you can understand why, no matter how your instructor flips the question, you're going to be able to answer it. Do not memorize. Try to understand why. Um, another contraindication is contraindicated with significant hemorrhage or possible chorioamnionitis. So if that patient possibly, you suspect that they have that infection, you're not going to give it to them. You're going to withhold. Myocardial infarction leading to death has been reported after use. Look at how many ways they told us patient with heart disease, we're not going to give it to them. They've told us in like five different ways, the same thing here. Continued. The beta adrenergic, oh, beta adrenergic agonist. You're going to assess maternal glucose and potassium because remember, it can cause hyperglycemia, um, it can cause hypokalemia. You're going to check those levels before you give the beta um, adrenergic um, agonist. And that makes sense because what if you check? that patient's um, potassium and you saw the potassium was 3.4, would you still give this medication? No, because you know this medication can cause hypokalemia. We're not trying to kill our patients. So that's why you're going to check before. You're going to check that blood sugar before. You're going to check that potassium before you administer that medication. And if the, their lab is out of range, you're not going to give that medication. You're going to withhold it and call the healthcare provider. Notify the physician if the following are noted. Maternal heart rate greater than 130. Withhold the medication and call the provider. Blood pressure less than 90 over 60. Withhold that medication and call the provider. Signs of pulmonary edema. Again, withhold that medication, call the doctor. Fetal heart rate greater than 180. Hyperglycemia occurs more frequently in women who are being treated simultaneously with corticosteroids. Why is that, Professor D? Well, remember, I always tell you guys this. When it comes to steroids, you need to keep these three things in, in, in mind. Steroids, number one, they increase your risk of fractures because they make your bones more porous. Number two, steroids mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So you have to assess that patient more closely for infection. And number three, steroids increase your blood glucose. Now we know that um, beta uh, adrenergic agonist by itself can cause hyperglycemia. And then you're giving them steroids that can also bring up their blood glucose. Do you understand why that makes sense? So we're gonna be very careful because both of these drugs increase the blood glucose. Ensure that propanolol enderol is available to reverse adverse effects related to cardiovascular function. Okay, we might have to bring um, that um, um, heart rate down. We might have to bring that blood pressure down. 
prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors, NSAIDs, such as your indomethacin. What does it do? It relaxes uterine smooth muscles by stopping the prostaglandins. That's how they work. Um, adverse effects, nausea, vomiting, heartburn, GI bleeding. We have to be very careful with that. And you guys can look at the rest on your own. Just pause if you need to read, guys. I'm not going to go over everything with you. You got to do some work here. Okay, nursing interventions. The prostaglandins are used only if the gestational age is less than 32 weeks. Do not use it in women with renal or hepatic disease. If they have problems with their kidney or liver, we're not going to use it. Active pep active peptic ulcer disease. Why? Because it can already cause GI bleeding. So that makes sense. Poorly controlled hypertension, asthma or coagulation disorders can mask maternal fever. So we have to be assessing this patient much more closely because it can uh, mask those signs and symptoms of infection, such as the fever. You're going to give that medication with food because remember, one of the things the patient's at risk for is ulcers or bleeding. So we're going to give it with food so they don't have the GI distress. And you're going to monitor for signs of postpartum hemorrhage. When it comes to prostaglandins, one of the first concerns that we're going to have in the back of our minds is that patient bleeding out. Okay. Lastly, on the meds is our calcium channel blockers. Remember, this is an anti-hypertensive medication. And uh, calcium channel blockers such as our nifedipine, it relaxes smooth muscle, maternal, hypotension. It's an anti-hypertensive medication. So safety is going to be an issue, right? It can cause dizziness, the patient can fall, right? Headache, flushing, nursing interventions. Avoid concurrent use with magnesium sulfate because skeletal muscle blockade can result. That is absolutely important for you guys to know. It should not be given at the same time or immediately after terbutaline because of effects on heart rate and blood pressure. I don't know why I didn't put a star next to that, but that's a common test question again as well, I should say. You're gonna assess the woman fetus according to the agency protocol and do not use sublingual route of um, administration. Now, since we've gone over these meds, now let's go back to box 17.5. Nursing care for the woman receiving tocolytic therapy. You guys can pause to read. I'm not gonna go over all of this, pause to read. Look at this, position the woman on her side, prefers, preferably the left side guy, remember, left side guys. Remember, you want to um, increase perfusion, okay? Position the woman on her side, preferably the left, to enhance placental perfusion and reduce pressure on the cervix. Monitor maternal vital signs, including lung sounds, because we wanna make sure there's no pulmonary edema going on and respiratory effort. Assess mother and fetus for signs of adverse reactions related to cold tocolytic medications. They talk about all those adverse reactions we went over on those tables. Look at this, limit fluid intake to 2,500 to 3,000 milliliters per day, especially if beta adrenergic agonist or magnesium sulfate is being administered. Look at the safety alert. Because magnesium sulfate depresses the CNS, it is essential, that word essential as in muy importante, very important that the nurse frequently assesses the woman's respiratory status, deep tendon reflex, level of consciousness. Remember guys, it depresses everything. So you have to assess this patient very carefully because we don't want that medication to work a little bit too well. Too well. Now we threw them on the other side. Beta adrenergic agonists, such as our terbutaline, that's the breathine, have been widely used as tocolytics. But remember something important that can cause tachycardia, hyperglycemia.
They should not be used in women with known or suspected heart disease, preeclampsia with severe features or eclampsia, pregestational diabetes or hyperthyroidism. Why do you think everything we saw here, we saw in the text and we also saw in the table over here? Why? Because it's gonna be a test question for you. Because this information is so important, the author knows that you're gonna see this as a test question somewhere in your academic career. So they keep giving you the same information in different ways to make sure it sticks in your mind. Whenever you guys are studying and you're reading and you see a, a, a content or something being repeated over and over, except in different ways, you see it in text, you see it in the table, you see it in the diagram, you see it in illustration, you see it in a figure, you need to say to yourself, this is going to be on my next exam. I need to know this. Okay, let's look at these two safety alerts. Administering nifedipine, remember that's a calcium channel blocker, and magnesium sulfate simultaneously at the same time can cause skeletal muscle blockade. That's the second time we're seeing this, guys. We already saw this either in the text or table. I don't remember, but this is the second time we're seeing this. In addition, nifedipine should not be given along with or immediately following a beta adrenergic agonist such as terbutaline. Why? The effects on the maternal heart rate and blood pressure. You think you're going to see that on test? Yeah. Here's another safety alert. It is essential to instruct women to slowly change positions from supine to upright, then sit until any dis dizziness disappears before standing. Why? Because they're at risk for hypotension. We don't want them to have orthostatic hypotension, stand up and then they pass out. So we teach them to sit, dangle their legs, move, move and get up slowly. Endomethacin, an NSAID has been shown in some trials to suppress preterm labor by blocking the production of prostaglandins. Didn't we just see that over here in this table? Yes, we did. We're seeing it again. That means it's very important for you guys to know. However, serious fetal or neonatal side effects have caused major concerns about the use as a tocolytic. Therefore, limiting the use of endomethacin to a period of two to three days in women with preterm labor, look at this, at less than 32 weeks. Remember, they, they said the same thing over here in this table. When it comes to the endomethacin, we don't want um, to give it, look at what it says, we want to limit the use to the period two to three days of women with preterm labor at less than 32 weeks. We don't want to give if they're less than 32 weeks. That is very important for you guys to know. Guys, um, I know, because I've taught out this book so many times, I know the book is going to go over more of um, the tocolytics, but in a different aspect. So this is going to actually be a two-part series. Um, on the next video, I'm going to start with promotion of fetal lung maturity. If there's anything that you would like to see me cover as far as um, maternity, OB, PEDS, med surge, pharmacops, anything in the nursing program, if there's anything you'd like to see me discuss in a lesson form, please let me know in the comments. Let me know what you thought about this video. Um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I release a new video where I cover questions and I teach you how to answer the questions and eliminate wrong answer choices. And don't forget, you can catch me every single day um, practicing questions with you on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will see me on the next video.